I'm Conrad Marshall, and from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is Good Weekend Talks, a magazine for your ears in which we take a deep dive into the definitive stories of the day. Every week you can download new episodes in which top journalists from across our newsrooms host conversations with the people capturing the imagination of Australians right now. This week, we speak with Nagi Mayhashi, the creator of cult cooking website Recipe Tin Eats, which has grown into a global success story since it launched almost a decade ago in 2014. Mayhashi talks with us about what inspired her to start cooking, her obsessive testing process, and how her former career as an auditor helped make her business so strong. And hosting this discussion, which includes generous mention of Mayhashi's much-loved sidekick Dozer, a golden retriever almost as popular as her food, is senior culture writer for The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald, Kerry O'Brien. Thanks very much, Conrad, and welcome, Nagi. It's great to speak with you. Hi, Kerry. How are you? Yeah, really well. Thanks for being with us today. So just to set the scene, you launched your website in 2014. I love the story that in, I think, the first day you had two visitors, you and your mum. (laughs) But these days, the picture looks very different. So your monthly website traffic is about 20 million. You have 3.6 million Facebook followers and a million Instagram followers. And your content reaches over 6.5 million people globally every week. So they're quite some figures. And Recipe Tin Eats Dinner, your first cookbook, which was published by Pan Mac last year, sold 37.2 thousand copies in its first week on sale. And these figures have continued to grow and break records. I understand the book hasn't left the top 10 bestsellers list across all categories, uh, not just non-fiction, since its release. And the figures I've got are now that it's sold over 200,000 copies, but that might even need updating. So it's quite something, Nagi. Why do you think it's struck such a chord? Uh, That's a good question, Kerry. (laughs) I think I ask myself that every day. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I won't sugarcoat it. I think the, the, the way the book has performed, the sales has definitely caught everyone by surprise. Actually, you should ask Pat and McMillan, my publisher, what the <laughs> print run was. Let me tell you, it was a lot less than we're ever about today. So Absolutely. I think, um, yeah, it has caught everyone by surprise. Obviously, we all hoped that it would do well, but uh, where, where it is today, it was quite unexpected. But um, yeah. It's pretty amazing. (laughs) Mm. One observation, um, I have got friends who are amazing cooks, my sister and brother-in-law actually, and they alerted me to Recipe Tin Eats a couple of years ago and said, you've got to get on to this woman, she's amazing. And that struck me because they rarely use recipes or they're not, you know, big on the recipe, but they um, use you as a go-to again and again. But your your recipes also meet the needs of first time novices, so straddling both ends of the spectrum is quite something. I think cookbook publishers would say that your publishers have mentioned that to you. I understand. Yeah, that's a really good point, Kerry. Actually, no other journalist has actually spoken to me about that before, and it's quite interesting. That's just the way I am. So seventy percent, maybe eighty percent of my life, I do those quick and easy recipes that anybody can make. Mediterranean baked eggplant. Seriously, this is like having a dip for dinner. <laughs> it is so good. Start by scoring diamonds into the eggplant, then rub with salt. Is a salad that makes you want to eat salad. And it's just practicality. So Monday to Friday, I'm on a I'm on a tight schedule. So and those are the quick and easy recipes that even beginners can make. Three essential bruschetta tips. Number one, sturdy bread. Can't make bruschetta with wimpy white bread. Two, more salt than you think you need. Tip three. Tip of the day: How to stop your guacamole from going brown? Just cover it in a thin layer of olive oil. Avocado is so dense, it's not going to absorb it, but it stops the air from coming in contact with the avocado, which is what makes But then on weekends, I do like to dabble in challenges. (laughs) So I do like to crack the back of cult foods, whether it's you know, they're trying to get the perfect crackling on a on a pork knuckle or making your own steamed Chinese pork buns. And then during the week, I'll make a quick and easy chicken piccata or, or a roasted eggplant. So it's just genuinely a reflection of me and how I am as a cook. And that's, I think, why I've been able to tap into 
both the ends of the market, if that makes sense. So, mm. yeah. I think there's also very much something, could you say, obsessive about your nature and your testing <laughs> of your recipes. <laughs> <laughs> that seems nice to come through. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to come through again and again. I think is it seventy oh, something? One of your cakes was tested, and one of your oh, ducks recipe. Time. Eighty-nine. Oh, oh, the duck! Don't talk to me about the duck. I never made it in the cookbook because I never got happy with it. But I made a lot of duck, a lot of duck, before I got to the point where it, you know what? It's too risky to put in the cookbook, so I ditched it. <laughs> um. Yeah, I know it, it sounds really strange. And again, it, it's not something that's forced in me. It's just genuinely the way I am because one of the reasons I I decided to start a website because I sort of saw it, a gap in the market is a pretty businessy way of putting it, but I did feel it was a gap in the market because I used to go online and, and search for a recipe and I'd be lulled by a beautiful photo and I'd jump on to see the recipe and I'd be like, oh, this looks amazing and I'd make it and it would be not very tasty or it would be a complete fail and so when I started publishing recipes I was adamant that I had to make sure that it would work just because it was free and online didn't mean that I was going to put anything out there that wasn't going to work so yeah and for me personally I I grew up in you know we didn't have very much money growing up so it's really ingrained in my being wasting food is just it's, it's criminal and so for me making sure that when people use my recipes that they're not wasting their money or their time and that they get to eat something delicious at the end of it is is important and yeah I I guess people do call me a little obsessive about it I think my team when they first started working with me they were pretty shocked at how obsessive I am about making sure my recipes work but yeah it's just I don't know I get really anxious if I see a typo in a recipe of mine and thinking that someone's making it a wasting a quick and easy chicken breast for midweek Maybe not such a big deal, but if someone spends $100 on a dry-aged roast beef and they're making for a special occasion, if, if it doesn't work because of an error in my recipe, that, yeah, it's a pretty scary thought. <laughs> mm. I wonder if you can tell us a bit more about your upbringing. A lot of uh, chefs and people in food talk about you know, learning at their mother's side as they were youngsters. <laughs> and I understand your story is quite different. <laughs> I know. I really actually want to give that romantic answer of like wrapping dumplings with my mother in the kitchen and singing songs. And no, <laughs> I was a horror of a child, Mary. Like I was honestly, I ran with the naughty girls at school and I was that kid who would, you know, sneak out of home in the middle of the night so my mum would, like, turn up in the morning and I need to find I'm not in the bedroom. Imagine that. Can you imagine that <laughs> this <laughs> scary. stress and your kid not being there in the morning? <laughs> you know, I never did housework. I never helped out in the kitchen. Didn't do the dishes. I was just, I was such a brat, Gary. It was honestly, um, and I didn't even realise it when I was a kid, but... We were just fed such great food. It was just expected, so I didn't know any different. And we never ate out because we couldn't afford it. Um, and then I moved out of home at 18 because I just wanted my independence, started a full-time job in corporate, went to university at night, and I was flat sharing and just didn't have very much money. I was a poor uni student. And the shock of not having good food on the table, just appearing on the dinner table every night, was such a shock to the system. And then realising I couldn't eat out, I couldn't afford to eat out. So I literally had to learn to cook just so I could eat good food. Wow. That's actually where it came from. Like it's, it was all around just being able to eat good food. <laughs> yep. Necessity. Did you have a go-to? And then I started and never stopped. Did you have a go-to at that stage? Can you remember where you were sourcing your recipes? No, actually. every I mean, things like bolognese I sort of scratched together just from my mum. And then a lot of it was just anywhere, newspapers. I got a lot of recipes from newspapers. I take a lot of photos from magazines. Um, so, you know, you'd flip through them and go, oh, I shouldn't admit this. But, you know, I was a poor uni student, so I'd be in the news <laughs> agents and I'd be flicking through magazines and I couldn't afford to buy all the ones I wanted. So the ones I couldn't afford, I'd snap a quick photo. And <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I used to, and I still do to this day, I borrow a lot of cookbooks from the library. Um, right. Just because I don't have space. I don't have space. And how many cookbooks do you buy where you only use one or two recipes? So... Yeah, I borrow a lot of cookbooks. Yeah. <laughs> well, yours is a particular um, site and now the book, but because uh, the book has a – I've never seen it before in a cookbook, but a QR code uh, which you can scan and then that brings up the videos, which um, seems like 
I guess, the way forward for maybe food publishing. But um, your videos are a very particular thing, the short, sharp sort of here's how to make a, a dish. You take the videos or traditionally you took the videos and you do your own photography which I was astounded to hear yeah um tell me about that is that sort of about this obsessive control or is it it, It is is that part of the fun (laughs) as well (laughs) a bit of both maybe a bit of both because I mean I I actually I love it but it's definitely quite time consuming and I'm I haven't outsourced it yet because I'm really struggling at the thought of getting someone else to do it. Firstly, I think it's really important for people, well, first, these hands are quite distinctive. Oh, look, they look even chubbier on your camera, <laughs> Carrie. Look, look how chubby and small Nuggie's they look. holding up her hands <laughs> to the camera. You can't see really listeners. Distinctive. But... <laughs> <laughs> I've got very distinctive hands and so no one else can cook in my cooking videos other than me because if anyone else did, you would know straight away. Um, but it's also part of the, again, it's that check, knowing that you can see it's my hands and so you know that I've made that recipe and it's not just some random person that's made it and some other person has photographed it and then someone else has invented the recipe. So I think it all goes to the fact that there's absolute clear proof there that it's me and always me cooking it and even if it's someone else's recipe and I do use, I, I don't always credit, you know, other if I use some a recipe from a cookbook or if my chef has made a recipe or it's my mother's recipe, but people always know that I have cooked it because they see my hands in the videos. Photos is another thing. I just have a very distinct idea of how I want a photo to look in terms of capturing what I think the deliciousness of the dish is. And I also insist on shooting everything hot and fresh out of the oven, whereas most photographers, just from a pure practicality reason, they'll often be working with cold food that they spray or style or do something tricky to make it look fresh. Yeah, Um, yeah, so it's just, again, it's, my interpretation of what I think makes a dish so delicious, I just want to try and capture that in a photo. So mm. that's why I do my own photos as well. And do you do a series of sort of back-to-back videos in a day and then, oh, no, you'd have to do the photography, I guess, on the back of the video. I'm just interested in a bit of the behind the scenes. The of, workload. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I do them separate. I, I generally do them separately simply because when I do a recipe video, quite often I'll sort of, muck up a dish to show the so imagine a cheesy pasta bake I've got to dig into it in the recipe video and show people how saucy it is and cheesy it is and and I've got to eat it and plate it up while it's hot and fresh so it looks fresh and then by the time I finish that it's so messy I can't photograph it so I'll make it again so every recipe is made a minimum of three times so you know even if I crack it first go then I film it and then I photograph it so that's a minimum three times but that never happens in reality because I never get a recipe 100% right first go. So right. it'll still be delicious and edible or it'll be okay to eat, but there's something, a process to improve or a flavour to improve or I need to get the scaling right or whatever it is. I can pretty much say I never get a recipe 100% first go. <laughs> That's actually reassuring to hear. <laughs> Major egg nog Late scrambled egg. <laughs> oh, no. Look at that. Oh, no. Nice. I wonder, a a couple of questions on that front. One of the big challenges is, I guess, time, but also inspiration. I remember interviewing you last year about what recipes you would put into the book and and that was your hardest sort of decision was what to include. And uh, it interested me, you you sort of said you had endless ideas. Where do you, how does that happen? How can we get a bit more of that in our everyday life, I wonder? Everywhere. I think part of it is because... I am just constantly thinking about food. I just, and I can't help it. I love it. Like I'll go for a walk to clear my head. You know what? I went for a run this morning, Kerry, and while I'm exercising, I'm thinking about food. How wrong is that? (laughs) (laughs) It sounds so wrong. But literally when I was running this morning, I I came up with some other ideas I just wanted to try. But it's, it's everywhere. Even when I'm at the, I go to the grocery store to pick up, you know, whatever I need and, I'll be looking at those cinnamon sauce jars and looking at what people are buying and I just go, oh, I can't believe someone would buy a honey mustard sauce in a jar and I'll be like, right, I'm going to make that and show people how easy it is. Or obviously restaurants and it might not be the exact dish I order at a restaurant but it'll be a flavour or an idea or a technique or something that just gives me a little, oh, I could do that and I can make it, I can make this at home and if I do this instead, I watch cooking shows obsessively. I just, that's all I watch. I don't watch Kardashians. (laughs) <laughs> I just watch cooking shows 
So it's right. everywhere because it's just always around me and I'm always just thinking and I'll just see something and it'll just give me an idea. So, yeah. <laughs> we'll be back in a moment. But in the meantime, reviews help people find us. So if you like what we're doing, it'd be great if you could help us out. Just jump on your podcast app and give us a rating to spread the word and let us know what you love. I wonder how it was taking your stuff out into the real world. I guess the book tour, tour in a way, was probably the first time you'd gone out into the world with it, was it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Coming out from behind the keyboard. Indeed, yes. How did you go? I'm, I'm, I imagine that would have been a lovely process, meeting people that are cooking your meals and, and loving them. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, it was, um, it was definitely it was definitely the scariest part with launching a cookbook because I have been just hiding behind a keyboard all this time. And even when you're, you know, on social media, it's still a screen. It's not real life. And so I was really nervous about going out. And But it was amazing. It was definitely the best part. It was by far the best part, meeting people in real life and hearing the stories. And I just did, I had no idea how, what a profound impact having recipe online can have on people in real life and hearing those out of people's mouths firsthand was truly amazing and there were lots of hugs and lots of tears and <laughs> it was Lovely. um yeah it was amazing and even since the book tour they've just been there were some particular people who just really struck a chord in me and I've kept in touch with them since and you know had one-on-one -on -one dinners with people since and yeah it's been amazing <laughs> Lovely. And do you get much feedback through the socials? Do people talk to you about, oh, this didn't work? I, I, I'm guessing that's your worst uh, yes. nightmare. <laughs> yes. But it's actually also like it, that, that's how I make sure my recipes are 100% right because people will raise something in social media. They'll, they'll say something like, oh, I'm not clear in the way you're preparing the eggplant for the masaka. And so I'll go back and reread my recipe and tidy it up or tighten it or give more instruction. Or So that, that's how my recipe writing kind of evolved through the feedback just reading the questions people ask and then there's a very common theme and you sort of just get to understand what that assumed level of knowledge is it's the same way when you're writing a story you know you you, you understand what the assumed level of knowledge of your readership is and then you write to that audience and that's the same as me now um, mm. Yeah. And do you have, you know, a handful of recipes that are the ones that people obsess about most or is it difficult to narrow narrow that down? It is a bit difficult now. It definitely recipes go up and down in terms of popularity depending on the day of the week, seasonality. Right. So on Sunday, my roast lambs and roast chickens are very popular, roast potatoes. And then Monday, bolognese, baked chicken breast, quick, the quick and easy. So it just yes. depends on the day of the week so yeah it's quite interesting mm. seeing it change from day to day yeah. okay so some tricks to get ahead this christmas yes you can make your glazed ham ahead this has been sitting here all last night i know you've just launched launched an sos collection through good food as part of the age and yes. Herald, which i thought was an inspired idea because people are really feeling the pinch of high interest rates and i wonder is that largely about sort of cuts of meat and seasonality i guess would be my instinct but anything more sort of broadly yeah it's um time speed and budget are the yep. are the main things there and i love it because it's the way i cook monday to friday anyway and I am constantly just going to the supermarket and seeing what's cheap in the fruit and veg section. And that is what's in season because that's what's cheap. I also love the, you know, the seconds part of the section where, the, where you've got the warped vegetables that are really, really cheap. So I just will get the good value things. And then I'm always looking at just interesting ways to make something delicious out of them. And now being able to share them each week in the SOS series, it's, uh, yeah, it's been really fun, actually. It's, it's a very natural fit with what I do, so it mm. works well. I think it's interesting to hear you say you, you know, shopping at the supermarket, your recipes, you know, they might have quite a few ingredients, but it's generally stuff you're going to have in the pantry or the fridge. There's, um, It's not a case of I need to go and buy, you know, a dozen things that I would never usually use and they're just going to sit in the cupboard and not be used again. Is that a deliberate thing or has that just been the way that you're it's cooking the way evolved? I am. Yeah. yeah, it's oh, genuinely the way I am. Also because there's a particular type of flavour profile that I like, which is 
you know, and Mexican and Middle Eastern and Southeast Asian are probably the three and Mediterranean probably. And there's actually Asian and then the other ones, but there's a lot of common ingredients in it. And it was interesting. I did a, um, I did a post last year where I said, oh, here's my, here are my most commonly used spices. And we figured out that with 12 spices that I constantly use all the time, you can make both 800 recipes on my website. Wow. So there's 12 spices that just get used in different combinations, different quantities. And if you look at, for example, Mexican food and Middle Eastern food, there's actually a lot of common spices. It's just the amount you use of different types. Mm. It's completely changed the flavor. So, yeah, it's really interesting. It's not about using gourmet ingredients. It's just about using the right amounts and different Mm. combinations. Yes, which actually brings me to your previous life. You were an auditor with one of the big five, uh, was it Price Waterhouse? Um, Price Waterhouse, yep. Yeah, and you left that to, to set up the website. Uh, I wonder if you can tell me about the relationship between your um, original career and, and your current career. There's some correlation, I understand. Yeah, there is. I think it's really interesting when I looked at it, and I was never asked to look at it until I started the book tour and people started asking me questions. It was quite insightful because when people ask me why they think my website's, um, you know, grown to the levels that it has, one of the things I talk about is put a, I put a lot of time into my writing um, and the recipes and how I write the recipes. It's, it's a very, I, I spend an inordinate amount of time writing and all of my all of my experience around that because I think people do go, oh, she's coming out of nowhere, she has no experience in, she's not a chef, she doesn't come from the hospitality industry. But what I have got is decades of experience in the corporate world where I spent a lot of time writing reports and I would have to take, you know, for example, very complicated transaction and write it in a way that whether it's a mum and dad and a prospectus or a board of directors who aren't financially minded at all need to understand that skill of taking something complicated and explaining it concisely without talking down to people, but in a clear way, that absolutely translates in what I do because that's the reason why I can write a beef wellington, which is probably one of the most challenging recipes in the world to get right and explain it in a way that people can understand and an ordinary home cook can understand. Mm. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of the way I look at it. I think, anyway. <laughs> yeah, it makes good sense. Such a different world you're in now compared to the corporate world. Do you do you miss those days? No. <laughs> <laughs> I get in to eat pork belly with crispy crackling today. <laughs> I would not be doing that if I was still an auditor. Let me tell you that. <laughs> it must have been a, a no. massive leap, though, because to go from a very secure, you know, well-paid, you know, job for life kind of area. Yeah. Terrifying. Did it feel like a Crazy. massive leap? Or, <laughs> what did it your mum say? <laughs> she was really, really supportive, but certainly okay. I had a lot of friends in my corporate world saying, you know, when are you coming back? You're crazy. And I, I definitely lost faith a number of times and, you know, you'd find me on the kitchen floor bawling my eyes and eyes out going, what am I doing? This is crazy, you know, and I was literally down to one month out from running out of savings and either having to go into debt or moving back in with my mum yeah. uh, when I made my first um, $300 on my website and that's what made me realise I think this can work and so I mm. decided to keep going with it and, um, yeah, I'm glad I did. But yeah, it was it was very scary. I don't have any other source of income. I don't. I'm not a trust fund baby. I don't mm. have family money, so I literally, I genuinely need to make my own living. So it was very scary to do it. But Absolutely. I'm glad I did. <laughs> yes. Now tell me, your mum, who I've seen in photos, there's obviously a beautiful relationship between you two. Such joyous shots. She also has a website, which um, I'm keen to write something about. Can you tell us briefly what hers is about? Yeah, so it's called Recipe to Japan. So it's an offshoot of my website and it's exclusively home-cooked Japanese recipes. And Kerry, I don't know if I've told you this, but this is another story. Like, you know, when you asked me how I got my love of cooking. So with my mum's website, I really want to tell you that she just wanted to share family recipes with the world. But actually, (laughs) the only reason why that website exists is because Myself and my siblings, we bullied her into starting it. And the way we bullied her into starting it is by saying, Mum, 
if you die without leaving us your teriyaki chicken recipe, we'll be really annoyed. So you <laughs> need to start a, You need to start writing down your recipes. You know, we need your den, we need your okonomiyaki recipe. We wrote down literally all our favourite recipes that we love her cooking. <laughs> Fantastic. You write them down. Yes, and document decided them. decided to write them down on a website. <laughs> she never Brilliant. Stopped. <laughs> it's such so, a good yeah. idea. We've got that idea in my family and we haven't done it, but we've talked about it. We must get these recipes down because once people go, you, you can't yeah. necessarily create the, uh, the same yeah. dish. So there's a lot of memory in food, isn't there? There is. Food association. I have so much food association. So most events in my life, I will remember <laughs> a dish on the day so yes. yeah it's 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 quite amazing <laughs> mm. now i would be remiss if i didn't ask you about a very special yeah. person in your life and that is of course dozer your golden retriever i have heard you say that you're asked down the street sometimes if if you're dozer's mum which is hilarious <laughs> um, people can't pronounce my name but they can pronounce his name <laughs> but does he really do a bit of taste testing you'd almost have to limit it wouldn't you because uh he would be there you know at the side if he's like my dog every other minute looking for a, a tasty morsel he gets pretty much anything he can eat he, he gets to eat. So, yeah. I mean, he's just around all the scraps and, yeah, like if we're you know, trimming meat or something, he'll get all the offcuts and, yeah, he does an inordinate amount of eating. Let's just say. It's amazing that he's not the size of a house. You know, <laughs> I, I just don't understand. I don't understand how he gets away with it. <laughs> I love that he's part of your recipe book and, you know, your whole thing because really many people have pets and, you know, love them and they are in the kitchen. It's not like they're, you know, stuck outside. Did you figure there was any risk with that or was that just being keeping it real? It's again, it's keeping it real. I think uh, it's interesting that you asked that because there was there was some question marks about including a dog on the cover of a cookbook. But yeah. <laughs> for me, it was never a question because the whole book is genuinely just me. This, what we we're talking about with the recipe testing and me insisting on doing my own photos and everything. It's again, it's just me being me, and he's always there at my feet. You know, asking for scraps and getting in my way. And... Oh, Dozer, you're so big. Don't crawl all over. Me. Oh, so it's going to be an exciting couple of months. I can't wait to meet you guys. So again, it's just no effort to include him in on my website, in my socials and in the cookbook because he's just there. You can't mm. miss him because he's so big. Yes. <laughs> you know? He could bowl you over very easily. <laughs> yes, uh. he can. He can. <laughs> Lovely. Um, and now, look, just before we finish up, I know that um, I think during lockdown you set up a, a meal service for homeless people in Sydney. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, it's called Recipe 10 Meals and I started it during the pandemic when it became very clear that there was increasing food insecurity in, in, in Sydney. As you can imagine, a lot of food banks get leftover ingredients and leftover meals from restaurants. And during the pandemic, most of the restaurants closed down. So there was a lot of urgent need out there. And actually, my chef, who works with me full time now, he used to have a catering company and he was affected by the pandemic. And his catering company had a kitchen in the city. Uh -huh. And because he had no need for it, it actually worked out perfectly because we use that as the kitchen for um, my food bank. And I have a team of three full-time cooks in there led by a professional chef making hot home-cooked meals every day. So it's definitely definitely the proudest thing in my professional career ever. And I always tell people it's the number one priority in my business. And if we all have to drop everything to go in there and help out to make sure that the promised meals get out every day, then, then we do. So... Yeah. Mm, lovely. Well, look, thank you so much for your time today. It's an absolute joy to chat and uh, very much look forward to seeing what, uh, what you're up to next. Thank you, Kerry. It's been a pleasure. Good Weekend Talks is brought to you by the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Subscriptions power our newsrooms. To support independent journalism, search subscribe Sydney Morning Herald or The Age. And if you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe, rate and comment wherever you get your podcasts. This episode of Good Weekend Talks is produced by Julia Karkatzel. Technical assistance from Cormac Lally. Editing from Conrad Marshall. 
Tom McKendrick is head of audio, and Katrina Strickland is the editor of Good Weekend. <laughs>